Hey, everybody. Welcome to Footnotes. It's our new podcast and, as you see, vodcast uh, produced by Fellowship Church. And what's the goal? The goal is when you teach a sermon uh, on a Sunday morning and you're going through a book of the Bible, a lot of times you have to make choices. You have to figure out, am I going this way with the passage or this way in the passage? And so there's things you have to leave out because whatever path you take, you're missing some things. And so what we're going to be doing on footnotes is when at Fellowship Church, we are going through a book of the Bible, on the week after, we'll come and make a footnotes episode where we go through the parts of the passage that weren't in the sermon so that we can give a better reading of the whole of the book that we are going through. If you're a member of Fellowship Church, welcome, love you. And we, as you know, are going through the book of Galatians. So let's start with Galatians. Now, what is Galatians? Galatians is probably Paul's first book or letter. Paul is a persecutor of the church who has converted to Christianity and is making his way back into Christian circles and dealing with people trying to figure out who he is and what he's doing. During that time, he had gotten into a conflict with a group of early Christians, and that conflict uh, forms a huge portion of all of Paul's letters. It doesn't matter what, which letter you're reading. If you're reading Galatians or Ephesians or Romans or whoever, you're going to see this conflict playing out. And so let's identify the main characters here uh, as we go into these first looks at the book of Galatians. So... Paul. Paul, of course, has become uh, the main writer of the New Testament. Paul was specifically by God sent to Gentiles. And if you're unfamiliar with the words, uh, the Jewish people called anyone who was not Jewish a Gentile. The word Gentile literally means the nations. So it's anybody who's not Jewish. Because in their mind, God had picked Israel to be his people. And of course, they're right in that. But they understood it by the time that Jesus comes along to mean these sort of exclusionary ideas that aren't really part of what God was trying to say to them. And Jesus challenged some of those things. So Paul picks that baton up and he begins to fight the very first ever Christian heresy. So what is the very first ever Christian heresy? It was called the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were Jewish Christians who thought that uh, the followers of Christ also had to follow part or all of the Old Testament law. So in the Old Testament, when God makes Israel his people, he gives them a group of commandments called the law. The most famous of these are the Ten Commandments. And he says, you have to live by these rules. And these rules make up everything from the moral commandments, things like don't lie, don't murder, don't steal. There's a ton more to how they're going to worship God, sacrifice animals these way, this way or that way, to the festivals, to the food laws that are we call kosher now. You had to follow those in order to be a member of the Jewish covenant. So that covenant Israel believes they have made a covenant with God that is unbreakable, that if they follow the law, they will be fine. But the New Testament comes along, and especially the Apostle Paul begins to challenge that notion very straight up and and hardcore against it, saying, wait a minute, there's all kinds of issues we've got to talk about if this is going to be how we talk about the Old Testament. Uh, Paul comes in. And begins to argue, now hold on just a second. Let's wait and think through this. Uh, And his conflict with the Judaizers specifically boils down to circumcision. Now, why is circumcision important? Circumcision is critical to the Jewish notion of being God's people. How can you be God's people and not follow the first order of God with his covenant people. And that boils us down to one of the most famous and important chapters of the Bible, and that is Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls a man named Abram and changes his name to Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham is one of the most key people in the Bible. 
And it is to Abraham that God says, I have chosen you. You are going to be the father of many nations, and I'm going to bless you uh, with all kinds of children. And so Abraham believes God, and he follows him, and he goes where God tells him to go. And then in Genesis 15 uh, is when God comes back to him and says, hey, listen, I am establishing this covenant with you. This covenant will be forever, and it will be from your children. And so Abraham goes, well, how can that be? I don't have any kids. How am I supposed to do this? And God says, I'm going to come back in a year, and you're going to have a kid, which is crazy talk because Abraham is like 90 at this point, and his wife is like 85 or however old. And he goes, there's no, how? And God says, I'll do it. And if you were to go, if you say you're going to get stranded on a desert island, and uh, they say you can take one verse from the Old Testament with you. A lot of people might pick, you know, uh, the Shema, which is "Hear, O Israel, our God is one." Um, they may take uh, some of the Psalms or something like. But I'm taking Genesis 15:6. Genesis 15:6 is one of the most critical verses in the whole Bible, and it says, "And God be- and, and Abraham believed God, and God counted it as righteousness." Now, if you are uh, theologically aware enough in your Christianity to understand that sentence is the basis of Christianity, Christianity is arguing that it is faith that makes us God's people and part of his covenant. And Paul goes to great lengths to prove these kind of things. Uh, The whole of Romans, the beginning of Romans, starts arguing this. Galatians argues it very powerfully. And then Romans comes along 20 years later and puts it very eloquently. And so Paul is very adamant about this, that it is faith that is the mark of the covenant, not the marks of the law, which came 400 years later. So when we talk about how are we going to to navigate these things, um, we have to talk through what's Paul's argument, because that's how we understand it now. So Paul says there was no law when Abraham became God's person. So you don't need a law to become God's person. If Abraham is our father, then how can Moses be the one who's 400 years later? How can Moses be the guy that tells us that how, here's how you follow? Because Abraham didn't do any of those things. He didn't, he didn't eat, he ate whatever he wanted to eat. But when God tells Abraham, I want to give you a sign of my covenant with you, um, he says you have to be circumcised. You are going to be circumcised. You know, Abraham's like 80, 90 years old, and he's like, what? But he says you have to be circumcised, and all your kids have to be circumcised, and all their kids have to be circumcised in order to be a covenant person. Now, how important is that covenant with Abraham? There are three religions in the world that all say they are the recipients of that Abrahamic covenant. Obviously, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Islam thinks they are the covenant people of Abraham. Now, both Israel and Islam both say you have to follow these laws. Uh, Unknown to a lot of people, Muslims have a dietary code much like kosher laws that says this is how you have to follow. But Paul comes back and says, no, that's not it. The mark of the covenant is not circumcision. It's faith. And he argues this very strenuously um, in Galatians. Galatians is like, uh, Galatians and Romans are very locked together because they're Paul explaining the gospel. But it's just, it's like the Reformation, if you, if you understand the Reformation uh, well enough. So the, Revo- the Reformation, there's a lot of fathers of the, Re- of the Reformation that happened in the 1500s. But I think most people would say Martin Luther is the father of the Re- of the Reformation. Well, Luther was a, a German, um, irritable, irascible dude. He, you can literally go on the internet now, and there's a website called the Luther Insult Generator that will let you read some, how he insulted somebody as if he's insulting you. In fact, let's pull up the Luther Insult Generator and see what we've got here. Uh, you are more corrupt than any Babylon or Sodom ever was, and as far as I can see, are characterized by a completely depraved, hopeless, and notorious godlessness. Let's do it again. Insult me again, Luther. 
even if the Antichrist appears, what greater evil can he do than what you have done and do so daily? <laughs> so, so just think of a classic German in a beer hall, you know, drinking beer and telling everybody they're stupid because that was Martin Luther. Um, in fact, his most famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, you know, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That was a beer hall song that he changed the words to so that people would know how to sing it. Um, but then that's Galatians. Galatians is raw. It is let's go, take no prisoners. And then uh, later on, Luther started reading the writings of a guy. He was like, finally, uh, he said a writing that has hands and feet, meaning it could do work. It was academically brilliant. And Luther was like, I could never write this well. Love this, whoever this is. Um, this kid's got it. Uh, and it was John Calvin. John Calvin was like 20-ish years younger than Luther, and he was in college. And Luther was like, wow, that's Romans. Romans is Calvin, and Galatians is Luther, so to speak. Don't let the Calvin thing, because you'll go, Calvinism, uh, boo, okay? Because I don't want you to be wrong, but you are. And uh, <laughs> so when you understand all that, uh, the main question, remember, is who is the inheritor of this covenant of Abraham. Who is it? And then we've already talked about how there are many arguments about who is the inheritor of the covenant. But Paul is going to very uh, passionately argue that the inheritors are the ones who are of faith. And in Romans 2.29, he really lays this out well. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Paul's arguing you're not a you're not a Jew if you were born a Jew. You're not a Jew if you follow the law as a Jew. He's saying you are a Jew, meaning an inheritor of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, if you are one inwardly. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit but not by the letter. Uh, his praise is not from man, but from God. Now, that's a play on words. Uh, the, the Jew uh, comes from Judah, right? The northern 10 tribes of Israel were destroyed um, about, I don't know, 500 years before Jesus came along. And then only Judah and the little bitty tribe of Benjamin survived. But then they were destroyed like 200 years later. And I think they had been gone around 300, 250, 300 years before Jesus came along. So the Israelites had picked up the name Jew because Judah was the only big tribe left. Well, what does the name Judah mean? The name Judah means praise. That's what, it, that's what the name meant in Hebrew. So Paul's playing on that. He's saying his praise, his Judaisness, right, his Jewishness is not from man but from God. So the distinction that Paul's making here is um, it doesn't matter who your father is, right, because being a Jew is a racial identity, not just a religious one. They are Hebrew because they are descendants physically from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Paul's saying it's not from a man. It's from God. And it's God giving you the approval that your faith has made you a child of Abraham, not your racial identity. So back to Galatians. This is the opening salvo of Paul's argument where he's beginning to lay out, this is what's going to happen. This is how this is going to play out. He reaches it. He, he proves himself that the faith is the characteristic of the covenant people, not the law. And he argues it several different ways, which we'll see as we go along into the book of Galatians. But where he really gets, when he gets done trying to make his proofs, when he makes his point, it's in Galatians 5. And I'm just going to read you real quickly. Uh, Galatians 5, I think 1 through 6, something like that, where the, all his arguments come into a point. And he says this, for freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Meaning, hey, Christ came to free you from the curse of the law. Now, is the law a curse? No, the law is good. It shows you how sinful you are. 
And he's saying Christ came to forgive you of that. If you base your, your relationship with Jesus on how well you perform, you are never going to experience joy because all you're going to see is how much you sin. But your salvation is not based on how well you did. Your salvation is based on what Christ did perfectly for you. And so Paul's very passionate about this. He wants people to realize, listen, you can't be perfect. And if you try to be perfect, you're just going to fail constantly. Rather, rejoice in what Christ has done for you. He says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. That's bad news. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, meaning I'll show God how good I am and he has to let me into heaven. You are severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. If you know anything about Christianity, that is a terrible, terrible reality. For through the the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. Man, that is such a key distinction. The Jews considered themselves righteous if they had followed all of the law, if they had been perfectly obedient They could claim righteousness. But Paul says, no, 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 no. I hope, I live in the hope of righteousness because on the day that I die or Christ returns, he is going to justify me and say he believed he is righteous before me. So it's a hope. It's a future reality. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through Love. Now, I need to add one thing here. <laughs> if you're a man and you've been circumcised and you're reading this and saying, hey, I'm out of Christ, that is not what he means. He means if you did it for religious reasons. That's what he means. Most of us had no choice. We all would have chosen no. <laughs> but here we are. If you want to know the flavor of this podcast, here it is. So, uh, again, uh, what's Paul dealing with? He's dealing with a, an, a very important issue of what is the basis of my relationship with God. Is it obedience to an external standard or is it obedience to an internal standard of belief, of trust, of hope? And he says, without hesitation, it is about your heart. It is not about how well you can conform because you can fake yourself out. Like the scariest sentence in scripture for most people comes from the Sermon on the Mount, where uh, Jesus says, many are gonna come to me and said, I did all the things you wanted me to do. I did all these wonderful things in your name. And Jesus is gonna go, I I don't know who you are. Because your external reality uh, can be wildly different from your internal one. But if your internal one is one of devotion to God, then your external will follow the orientation of the heart. And so that's what Galatians is about. It gets pretty raw. It gets pretty brutal. But he's trying desperately to wake people up to what a real relationship with God is like. So all of that to say, uh, this is why doctrine and theology matter. Um, For many people, they're dry, boring, philosophical topics that have nothing to do with life. And I get that because so many of the ways are just academics arguing with each other. But theology and doctrine is life. It is God's attempt to help us understand him. And he's everything. Our entire lives are oriented toward him. And to understand that is to bring the source of life into a place in your heart and mind that give you encouragement and comfort and hope and peace. Doctrine can be used in terrible ways and has been. Um, My life story is one of having been exposed to different doctrines and having horrible, you know, results because of it until I became a Christian when I was 18 and realized, wait a minute, now I understand what they mean by the word is living and active. And I knew that God's call to me was to help people experience the same moment I had experienced, 
because now they understood the heart of God in grace and the heart of God in what discipleship is. It's not about, hey, you know, be sexually in line with God's principles and let, show each, outdo each other, trying to be the best, most humble, loving person you can be, and then you'll know you're safe. No, actually, that's how you'll never know you're safe. Only the security of Christ's actions can secure us with God. And he begs us to put all our hope on his broad shoulders rather than our stumbling feet. And so that's what I hope this podcast is for you. I hope it's a place where you come to be further encouraged that salvation is God's very firm grip on you and not your very loose grip on him. So thanks for joining us. I hope you'll join us every week when we do these. Grace and peace.